Earth Registered Nurse Arian.com, and in this video, I'm going to be going over blood transfusions, which will include the nurse's role. And as always, at the end of this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this procedure. So let's get started. What is a blood transfusion? It is where, as a nurse, we will transfuse a patient who is low on red blood cells with new red blood cells via a venous access of some type. Now this is most commonly done through donated red blood cells. So a patient needs them, someone's donated them to the blood bank, and as a nurse, we will hang a bag of red blood cells for the patient and transfuse them to replace those low red blood cells. Which answers the question, why would a patient need a blood transfusion? Because they're low on red blood cells. And what can cause a person to be low on red blood cells? Well, number one, blood loss. If they've had some type of surgery or trauma, they can lose a lot of blood, so we have to replenish them with red blood cells. Or they're anemic. They can have anemia so bad that they need blood transfusions at some point, like because they don't produce enough red blood cells. And this can happen in conditions like renal failure, cancers, just to name a few, because the body is not producing enough substances to um, produce or maintain those red blood cells. Now, what's the importance of red blood cells? They are very vital for our survival and how our body works. So in other words, our body can't function very well without them. So what do red blood cells do? With the help of hemoglobin, it carries oxygen it receives from the lungs throughout our body. In addition, it removes carbon dioxide, CO2, and it will take that, take it to the lungs so the lungs can exhale it. Therefore, whenever your patient is low on red blood cells, they're gonna have some signs and symptoms that can present, especially if they're really low. They'll be very pale. I've seen patients, they literally look white as a sheet before the transfusion, and then after the transfusion, I've told a lot of my patients, Man, you look like you got a tan because they their skin color is back to where it should be. So it's really interesting. If you transfuse blood, make sure you look at that. Another thing is they can feel very fatigued. They can be short of breath. Any activity, they're just like really wore out. And they can have an increased heart rate, be tachycardic, because that heart is trying to pump that blood because it can sense that the oxygen's low, so it's like, I gotta get more blood everywhere else so it can overwork itself. So when is a patient transfused? Well, this really depends. Depends on what's going on with the patient, their vital signs, how are they tolerating that low blood level. And recent guidelines by the American Association of Blood Banks recommends transfusing blood when hemoglobin levels fall to seven to eight grams per deciliter. So then what is a normal hemoglobin level? Well, it depends if you're male or female. Males, it's 14 to 18 grams per deciliter, and females, it's 12 to 16 grams per deciliter. Now let's look at the nurse's role with transfusing blood. Now transfusing blood is very common in the hospital setting, and you not only need to know this for NCLEX, your nursing lecture exams, but you need to know it for the job. Okay, the first thing before a patient is even transfused is a lot of prep work that is super important and essential because our prep work helps prevent transfusion reactions. So we wanna make sure we follow exactly what we need to. And hospitals have in place protocols that whenever you become a new grad, you start working, you wanna read over their protocol and make sure that you follow it exactly. Now most hospitals require that you're a registered nurse in order to transfuse the blood. So again, follow your hospital protocol with that. So let's say you got an order for a patient to be transfused with two units of packed red blood cells. What's the very first thing that's gonna be done? The patient is going to be typed and cross matched. Either you'll be drawing the blood or your phlebotomist will be drawing it, and this is the part where you've got to pay special attention to everything, from what you write down to how you identify the patient, you place the blood band, everything must be done perfectly because we don't want, due to like some type of clerical error, to cause a transfusion reaction because someone messed up, which tends to be the most common reason for a transfusion reaction. So always take care whenever this has to be done. Next, send the blood 
Lab's going to type them. Blood bank will match the blood with a donor and will prepare the amount of blood that you're going to need. Now, it's also important that as the nurse, you know the patient's ABO compatibility and their RH factors, what blood they can receive, what blood they can't receive. And I have a whole video where I went over that in depth with you and you can access that and take a quiz that can test you on that. But just a quick review, who is the universal donor? Who can donate to all types? That's O. Now, who is the universal recipient? They can take from everyone. That's A, B. Next, you'll want to get informed consent. Tell the patient what they're gonna be receiving, assess their understanding of it. Also, this is a good time to ask about their allergies and if they have received any blood transfusions in the past. And if they have, how many? Because if they have received a lot of blood transfusions in the past, they're at risk for febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction where their body has just built up these antibodies from all those previous transfusions and they can start running a fever and things like that. So a lot of times physicians like to pre-medicate them and you'll want to let the physician know if they do have a history of that and sometimes they're pre-medicated with Benadryl or Tylenol acetaminophen beforehand. Orally you'll want to give it about 30 minutes before you start the transfusion and that will help prevent that. Also look at the health status of your patient. Are you giving a patient who is in fluid overload or congestive heart failure, has renal failure, but they really need blood? You need to be looking at that because they may be at risk for circulatory overload where you can put them in fluid overload because you're putting all this blood inside of their body. So a lot of times physicians may order Lasix, some type of loop diuretic before the transfusion or in between the units or after the transfusion. So you want to be aware of that as well. Next, you'll want to make sure your patient has IV access. We have to get this blood in them. And you typically want an 18 gauge or larger IV site. Some hospitals, again, it varies on protocols, they'll allow you to transfuse through a 20 gauge. And why is that? Well, as those red blood cells are shooting through there, going into the system, if that cannula is not large enough, those red blood cells can break open, they can lysis, and you're just breaking them up and they're not really going into the patient's body. So you want good IV access. Another thing you really want to consider is, you know, it takes in anywhere between two to four hours for a unit of blood to transfuse. Well, if you have to hang some antibiotics on this patient or they're gonna need some IV drugs, you can't use that IV access that is being used for the blood transfusion. So you need a second access. So keep that in mind. It's always good to just have good two sites while a patient's needing blood. Next is supplies. Whenever you transfuse blood, you use special tubing, which is called wide tubing with an inline filter, which helps filter some of those substances out of the blood before it actually goes to the patient. And keep in mind, again, it depends on hospital protocol. A lot of protocols say only one set of Y tubing per unit that you transfuse. So you'll have to, if you're gonna transfuse the patient with more than one unit, you'll need multiple sets. Or some hospitals say it's only good for four hours. So keep that in mind when you need to change your, filter, your tubing. Next, you'll want to grab a bag of normal saline, 0.9% of normal saline. This is the only, only solution you ever use whenever transfusing blood. You never use any med other medications or any other fluids, only saline. Remember that because say you gave it with a dextrose containing solution. Dextrose and red blood cells don't get along. It can cause them to clump up together. So only 0.9% normal saline. And we will be using that saline to prime that Y tubing with and then to flush that tubing with afterwards once the blood is done transfusing. And in addition, just whenever everything's wrapped up, you're ready to take that tubing down, you'll need to get a red biohazard bag to dispose of it properly. Again, follow your hospital protocols for how they dispose of their blood products, but um, you never ever put it in the regular trash. Now let's talk about transfusing. Okay done all your prep work, the blood bank calls you and says, hey, your blood is ready. Let us know whenever you're ready for us to send it to you because they're keeping it refrigerated for you. 
So some key things you want to remember. You will be giving one unit at a time. Patient needs two units, you're going to give one unit now and then whenever that's done, call blood bank and say send me the other unit and then they'll send it to you. So one at a time. And from the time that the person brings you your blood or you go and collect it, you need to start transfusing no later than within 20 to 30 minutes and it needs to be done, that unit needs to be done within two to four hours. So why is this? Well, from the time that that blood bag leaves the refrigerator, it needs to be in the patient's body within no more than four hours because there's a risk of it developing bacteria and we can give the patient septicemia. So you want to transfuse it in that time frame. Also, another thing you just want to consider, I want to throw this out there, is notify the blood bank that you're ready for the blood when you're ready because you need to get this in. And as a nurse, you get your blood, say you have mission discharge, you have a patient that is just not doing good, that 30 minutes flies fast and you have this blood and you haven't even given it and now it's like 35 minutes later. Well, you can't give it. You're going to have to send it back to the blood bank and blood is expensive. So notify the blood bank whenever you're ready to start that transfusion. Now, blood warmers. Blood warmers can be used if the patient needs large amounts of blood quickly and they're at risk for experiencing hypothermic response. So you're not gonna warm the blood up by using a microwave or anything like that. You want to use a special device if need be. Next, before you even start the transfusion, you're gonna be doing this verification process. So as the nurse, you're gonna be getting another nurse. It's usually two RNs, because RNs are usually the ones who can transfuse, and then you're gonna do another verification process with another RN. And you're going to be looking at the following things before the transfusion. Together, you're gonna to be verifying the physician's order. You're gonna be looking at the patient's identification versus the blood bank's information, making sure everything matches up perfectly. You're going to look, look at the patient's blood type versus the donor's type and the RH factor. You're going to make sure that they're compatible. Next, you're going to look at the expiration date on the blood, make sure it's not expired. You're going to look at the blood, make sure it doesn't have any clots or abnormal substances in the blood or it's damaged in any way. And everything must match perfectly. And if there's a discrepancy, you'll need to notify the blood bank immediately. And just from personal experience, this has happened with one of my patients. I was doing the whole verification process with another nurse. We were looking at the blood bag, looking at the patient's ID band, looking up, and there was one letter that they had did a clerical error on. So I had to send the blood back and we had to go through the whole process again. So this does happen, so always make sure you verify everything. Also before transfusing, you're gonna be getting baseline vital signs, which is gonna include the temperature, the blood pressure, respirations, and heart rate. And you wanna make sure those are within normal limits, and especially that temperature. If you have a temperature greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll wanna notify the physician and make sure they just wanna still proceed with the blood transfusion. Then, again, before you actually transfuse, you wanna explain to your patient if they're alert and oriented, they can talk to you, what you're about to do, and for them to notify and report to you if they feel any of the signs and symptoms that I'm fixing to describe, because it can be a transfusion reaction, like sweating, chills, chest pain, itching, short of breath, headache, backache, or nausea and vomiting. And if this happens, you'll immediately want to stop the transfusion. Okay, now it's actually time to start the transfusion. So you're going to have your blood ready, hung, and it's going to be controlled by an infusion pump, which will deliver it to the patient. And you want to start the transfusion slowly, about two milliliters per minute for those first 15 minutes. In addition, you want to stay with that patient at their bedside, looking at them, monitoring them for those first 15 minutes. And why is that? Why are you doing that? Well, you're running it slowly because we want to minimize the amount of blood that the patient's going to receive in case they do have a possible transfusion reaction. We can turn that blood off. And we want to stay with them during the first 15 minutes because that's when most transfusion reactions occur. So 
We're gonna be watching their vital signs throughout, so you're gonna stay with them. After five minutes of starting the transfusion, you're going to get vital signs. And again, this is depending on your hospital protocol. And then after that, you'll get them at 15 minutes after the transfusion has started. And if the patient's okay, they're tolerating it well, this is the time that you can increase the rate. And remember, you wanna make sure that that unit, that bag of blood goes in within four hours, no more than four hours. Then you'll get it at 30 minutes again, and then hourly until done, and then one hour after the transfusion. And throughout that blood transfusion, you're gonna be monitoring them for, of course, a transfusion reaction. And transfusion reaction, that word is like an umbrella term for a lot of different reactions the patient can have. And here in a moment, we're gonna go in depth over those, but it's where the recipient, that patient's immune system, is interacting with the donor's blood. So you can have a hemolytic, transfusion reaction where what's happening is that the patient's blood and the donor's blood are not compatible and the immune system is attacking that donor's red blood cells that they're receiving and this is dangerous, it can lead to death. Also allergic, they can have a febrile, which is non-hemolytic, or GVHD, which is graft versus host disease. And I have an asterisk by this because this tends to happen days to weeks after a blood transfusion, it's rare and it's deadly if it does happen. And in addition, you wanna monitor your patient for what's called circulatory overload. And which patients do you think would be at risk for this? Think of any patient that's at risk for whenever you put extra fluid volume in their blood, they'll have trouble with it, like patients who have heart problems, like congestive heart failure. Their heart muscle's weak and you just throw that extra fluid in it, it can't do well with it, so the fluid starts backing up into the lungs and into the tissues, they have breathing trouble, things like that. Also patients who have renal failure, you know, these patients need blood, but they're at risk for being able to tolerate all that fluid going in there. So you wanna keep that in mind, you do have to transfuse these patients who have that. In addition, we want to monitor them for septicemia. Now let's look at a way on how we can remember all those big signs and symptoms that your patient may be having a transfusion reaction. So to help us remember those major signs and symptoms, let's remember the word reaction. Okay, R for rash. They may have a rash or hives. E for elevated temperature. And what you wanna do is you wanna look at that baseline temperature and you need to ask yourself, has it increased? And if you're measuring in Fahrenheit, has it increased 1.8 degrees? Or if you're recording in Celsius, has it increased one degree from baseline? If so, think transfusion reaction. A for aching, is your patient saying, I have a backache all of a sudden, or I'm having chest pain, or my head is hurting? That's a red flag. C for chills. T for tachycardia, especially if it's really increased from baseline. I for increased respirations. Same thing with that as an increase from baseline. O for auguric. So you really wanna be looking at your patient's urinary output during this blood transfusion and after. Are they putting out low? Or are they just putting out no urine at all? Are they aneuric? And then look at the color. What does it look like? Are they experiencing a condition called hemoglobinuria, where there's free hemoglobin in the urine? It'll have like this purplish color. So watch the urine closely. And then in for nausea, GI issues like diarrhea. Then when the transfusion's done, your patient's tolerated it well, you'll want to flush that remaining blood out of that line with that saline that's hanging on that Y tubing, then dispose of your tubing properly, and then collect post vital signs one hour after that transfusion. Now let's take a closer look at those various transfusion reactions and then talk about what you're gonna do as a nurse if your patient does have a transfusion reaction during a blood transfusion. Okay, first, hemolytic. This is where the immune system is killing the donor's red blood cells. So what's happened, antibodies in the recipient's blood match the antigens on the donor's blood cells. So hence, they've been mistyped. And this can lead to DIC and renal failure and even death. And a lot of times what's gonna happen is you're gonna see a fever, chills, anxiety, back pain, chest pain hemoglobinuria, where you have that purplish look to the urine. Also, they can be tachycardic and have a low blood pressure. Another type is called allergic, and this is where the recipient's immune system is reacting to the proteins found in the donor's blood, leading to like rashes, hives, 
and itching, and it can actually progress to anaphylaxis. And the patient with this can have hives, rashes, respiratory issues like wheezing, oral swelling, things that you expect whenever someone's having an anaphylactic reaction to something. Another type is febrile, and this is non-hemolytic, so you don't have the breaking up of those red blood cells like you did in hemolytic, but this is where the recipient's white blood cells are reacting with the donor's white blood cells, and this causes the body to build antibodies. So you can see that increased temperature, like one degree Celsius or 1.8 degree in Fahrenheit from the baseline, and this is actually the most common transfusion reaction that you tend to see, especially in patients who have received blood in the past because their body has created these antibodies. So that's why you want to ask them, have you received a lot of transfusions before? And you can see chills, headache, increased heart rate, and fever with that. And another transfusion reaction you can have is the GVHD, the graft versus host disease. And again, like I said, this is rare, but it's deadly, and it tends to occur days to weeks after the transfusion. So this is where the donor's T lymphocytes cause an immune response in the recipients by actually engrafting in the marrow of the recipient and attacking the recipient's tissue. So these T lymphocytes are usually killed by the recipient's body, but however, maybe the patient has a suppressed immune system and they didn't attack these T lymphocytes whenever they're getting the transfusion and these T lymphocytes from the donor start attacking that marrow. And what can happen is they can have a fever and this really peculiar rash all over the body. It'll be on the hands and the feet as well with GI issues, diarrhea, nausea, um, inflammation of the liver. And you want to talk, you want to tell your patient, you know, if you start having this rash from head to toe, the, this fever, diarrhea, all this stuff, for several weeks after you've had this blood transfusion, you wanna report that to your doctor. Other complications that can arise that really are immune related is like septicemia where the blood is contaminated. So as a nurse, again, it's really important that you start that transfusion promptly after receiving it from the blood bank or the blood is contaminated with a disease. Now this isn't as common because we have strict screening guidelines, but there are can be a risk for hepatitis B, C, or HIV, et cetera. Also that circulatory overload we were talking about or developing high iron levels. And this happens with people who've had frequent blood transfusions. Now let's talk about if your patient does have a blood transfusion reaction. And I have seen this, this does happen. So keep it in the back of your mind. So the first thing what you wanna do is stop the transfusion. And you want to note mentally what time this occurred, what time you stopped it, because you'll be documenting this later on. Also, you're going to disconnect the blood tubing at the access site and replace it with new tubing and have some 0.9% normal saline running to keep the vein open. Then you're gonna notify the doctor and the blood bank of what's going on, but during all this, you're gonna be staying with the patient at their bedside. You need to be watching them. You need your eyes on them. So this is a great time to call in other people on the floor to be helping you make these phone calls to be doing these things. Next, you're gonna be monitoring those vital signs every five minutes, looking at them, watching them, looking at that respiratory status. It's not compromised or they have an allergic response. What's going on? Now, whenever you contact the physician, depending on what type of reaction they suspect the patient's having or how severe it is, what's going on, they may order some medication, so it varies. Some things they can order is like corticosteroids, which is gonna suppress that immune response along with fluids, helping flush out that free hemoglobin that's in the body, getting it out, we want it out of the body. Antihistamines anti to decrease that immune response. Antipyretics to help decrease that temperature. Vasopressors, this can help if they're having an allergic response like epinephrine to open up the airways because a lot of time those airways clamp down and they can't breathe, or like dopamine to increase renal blood flow, or diuretics. Also some labs are gonna be ordered. They wanna look at those clotting levels, because remember if this is hemolytic type, 
because a lot of times they don't know what type of reaction this patient is having. They want to look at those clotting factors because they're at risk for DIC where all their clotting factors are just going to be depleted and they can bleed out and die. Looking at those electrolytes, looking at the renal function, how's our kidneys and other blood levels. In addition, you'll be collecting urine, urine on them, looking for the free hemoglobin that's came from those red blood cells that have lysis. And whenever you are disconnecting your tubing over here, do not throw it away. Don't throw any of it away because you'll be sending that along with the leftover blood and any other documentation to the blood bank who's going to test it, look at it, and see what went wrong. And of course, you're going to document. You want to document the time it happened, what actions you took, what the patient was given, if you gave them anything, what labs you drew, all of that, and how the patient is currently doing. Okay, so that wraps up this review over blood transfusion. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.